All right, 9.30. You ready to get in God's Word this morning? Come on, it's going to be an awesome time. I'm thankful that you're here. And again, I want to say thank you for being our first-time guest. If it is one of your first times with us, it means so much that you would join us today. We're going to be reading from the book of Ruth today, which is in the Old Testament. And so if you've got your Bible, you can open up and turn there now. If you don't own a Bible, we have Bibles in the back. We would love to give you one. And of course, we'll have the screen Bible up here for you, and uh, you'll be able to follow along. But before we get into the Bible, I want to share some things about what you are doing right now. See, it may seem like you're just sitting there and just taking in the message and we're going to laugh a little, say amen a couple times, worship and sing. Your body is actually working right now in incredible ways. In fact, I was doing a little research this week as to what our bodies do when we are just simply sitting and so maybe your mind will be as blown as mine was with what your body's actually doing. Your heart pumps 2,000 gallons of blood through it every single day. Isn't that crazy? Like 2,000 gallons are just going to pass right through your heart, and you did nothing to make that happen. Your heart is going to beat 100,000 times this day. You're going to take 17,000 breaths. Your brain is going to pass 50,000 thoughts. Now, I think if you're a daydreamer, it's more like 500,000, all right? Where are my daydreamers at? We're just like, man, I'm always thinking, right? You're, this is cool. You're going to blink 28,000 times today. And this one's a little gross, but it's science. You're going to shed more than 1 million skin cells today. So can we just give it up for our facilities team that's going to clean up our skin cells after the 11 o'clock service? I mean, they're everywhere. We just can't see them. What's so interesting about those facts is that while we are sitting here and, and just kind of taking in God's presence and being encouraged and seeing one another, it may feel like our bodies are not working, and yet they are at work. Like, they're constantly working. If they stop working, that's when you know there's a problem. And some of us, maybe you've experienced that. Your lungs are not taking in all those breaths. And so you go to the doctor and say, there's something wrong with my, my cardiovascular, my respiratory system. Why? Because it's not working the way that it should. And so your body, created by God, designed by him, is going to work really, really hard today. And before this moment, probably most of us weren't even aware that that work was going to take place. Not even aware that that was happening. Now, I want to kind of connect the dots here in our relationship with God. Too often in my life, it can feel like and it can seem like God's not working. Can someone say amen if you've ever felt that before? It's all right. It's Blaze Church. We're honest. Right? It can feel like, where is God? Is God still at work? Is he still working? Because I don't see him working the plans that I have for my life don't seem to be the plans that he has for my life. Maybe for you, it has to do with your marriage, or maybe you're on your second marriage or third marriage, or you've given up on marriage. You didn't have those plans when you said the first, I do, and yet now, here you are. And it feels like, is God still working? Maybe it has to do with your children. You've prayed for them. You, you taught them great values. You pointed them to Jesus, and now they're older, and they're living for themselves, and you're wondering, is God working? Why am I going through this financially? Why am I going through this physically? Where is God? Because I don't see him. Well, today, I want us to look at the story of Ruth and its conclusion, and here's what we are going to discover together. God is always working. And I want you to say this with me because I want it to move from our mouths to our hearts by the time this 25-minute message is up. Let's say this. God is always working. Okay, now let's put the emphasis on the always because that's the part that kind of trips us up. Ready? God is always working. I feel like this is how Sesame Street started. Right? So let's just say, everyone say the letter A. All right, so you guys did a great job there. God is always working working. He's always working. And what we're going to discover today as we read Ruth chapter 4 in just a minute is that the story of Ruth, its conclusion will show us that God was always at work in the life of Naomi. Now, if you're just jumping into this story, I don't want you to feel lost. I'm going to catch you up real quick. We've been reading about a Jewish woman named Naomi who her and her husband Elimelech and their two sons during a time of famine in Israel, specifically Bethlehem, they turned away from God's people and they went to the land of Moab. 
In the first week, Pastor Amy showed us how the land of Moab is the land of compromise. And they left God in his ways and they thought life would be easier where there was, there was a lot of compromise and a lot of sin. And along the way, Naomi lost her husband. She lost her two sons. But before she lost her two sons, they both married Moabite women. Now, what we need to understand today is that a Moabite was an enemy, the exact opposite as a person of Israel. They worshiped other gods. Their practices were detestable. So imagine, especially if you're a mom, because this is Naomi, your two boys marry people who just don't have the same family values. They're, they don't worship the same God. And you're looking and saying, they're going to turn you away from God. And then she loses her sons. And ultimately, she returns back to Bethlehem with Ruth, who the story is named after, this Moabite widow. And we start to see how Ruth is faithful. She's got integrity. She's choosing God's ways. She converts from being a Moabite to being a Jewish woman. And all of a sudden, we see Boaz, the hero, enters the story. And it's really been like this unfolding romance between Boaz and Ruth. And Ruth and Naomi are in trouble at this point. They're in deep poverty. Because now, we don't know how long they've been back in Bethlehem, but what we do know is they can't go on living without some redeemer. Someone who will purchase their land and someone who will marry Ruth so that their family line might continue and succeed. And so what we have over a decade in the making from Ruth 1 to 4 is a woman named Naomi who's got to be wondering, where is God? That's where we find ourselves in this story because we've all wondered that before. Where is God? Is he working? Why isn't he working the way I need him to? And so we're going to see the conclusion of this story and discover what's our teaching point. God is always working. Okay, Ruth chapter four, verse one. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat down there just as the guardian redeemer he had mentioned came along. Now, if you remember last week, Ruth asked Boaz to marry him. We learned a lot about what it means to have integrity with sex and integrity with marriage and what God's plan is for sex and marriage. And Ruth proposed to Boaz. Remember her proposal line? I remember, right, spread your wings over me, right? We discovered what that means. And, and now Boaz says, I can't because there's someone who's closer. There's a closer kinsman redeemer. And look, here he is. Just as he gets to the gate, that guy shows up. And Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. And Boaz took 10 of the elders of the town and said, sit here, and they did so. Now, before we see what happens, I, I want to kind of let you down for a moment, because this is not going to be a romantic wedding scene by any stretch of the word. This is not the notebook, everybody. Like, Boaz didn't go and build a house for Ruth, and she read about it in the Bethlehem Daily newspaper, and then traveled to find the house. This is not that, Okay. We are about to see a very legal scene. An exchange is going to take place. And yet, I want you to understand this. If we can grasp the beauty of this scene, although it's not the romance that we want in this society, we can understand and appreciate the redemption that we have in Jesus even more. And who wants to experience that today? Like, that's our point and our purpose of coming together. You know, you just saw a video, and in the back we have a sign our vision at Blaze Church is to blaze the way for people to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. And our Sunday services are all about us knowing God more. Today's point is that we would know the redemption that we have because of the work of Jesus more. That's going to fill our hearts with joy and gratitude. That's going to change our perspective on our circumstances. And so what we're about to see is not some beautiful love scene. It's a legal scene, but it's no less wonderful. So, verse 3. He said to the guardian redeemer. Now, he doesn't have a name. Let's call him Jerry. Is everyone okay with that? <laughs> Jerry. Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me, so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. Okay, 
I told you, this isn't super romantic. It's very legal. <laughs> it's kind of like he's making his opening statement. He's assembled his jury of witnesses. He has the town elders. He's coming and he's saying, wait, here's what's on the table. Naomi has a piece of land and she's going to sell it. Hey, and, and you're next in line, Jerry. Like you get first dibs on the piece of land because you're the closest to Elimelech, her former husband who is deceased. Everyone tracking so far? Hey, so he says there's a piece of land. Naomi's got to sell it. You're next. I want it. So if you don't take it, I'm going to take it. That's what we have on the table at this point from our guy, Boaz. A couple things. One, we have seen that Boaz is a man of integrity. He's not lying here. The author hasn't told us about this piece of land yet. This is the first time we're hearing about it. So I don't want you to think, oh, Boaz isn't talking about Ruth. Where does this land come from? What is this, chapter 3.5? I didn't get that in my Bible. Where did that come up? Hey, all we're seeing is the story unfold that now the author who's telling the story wants us to know Ruth has a piece of land that she's selling off. Well, what we can know, because she's selling it as a widow, it's probably the last piece of property to her name. It's the thing that's keeping her even alive in society because it's producing fruit and food for her. But she's in so much poverty that now she has to sell the piece of property. And what's so interesting about property sales in this time versus today is God actually divided the land through Moses to different people and they crossed into the promised land. What that means is that Naomi is selling off not just some piece of land. It's not real estate. This is heritage. This is spiritual. This is a blessing that God has given to the family of Elimelech, her former husband. Think about how much poverty she's in that now she has to say, I can't maintain it anymore. Now, God in his beauty, what he established is what we're seeing. I want you to see the beauty of this legal moment because God wanted the people of Israel to take care of one another. And so when they were in poverty so that they wouldn't be picked up as slaves by another people group, this law that we're seeing that Boaz is telling Jerry about, it was actually a law of love. Because what it was is saying, sell it off to a kinsman, to a redeemer, to a family member, to a Jewish person, so that you don't become a slave to another people group. So that this person will love you. They will keep you living on the land. This, in my opinion, is an example of a small group. It's a group of people that will care for one another, that will protect one another. See, today is a really fun Sunday because today our summer small group directory is going to open later tonight. You're gonna get an email that says, the directory's open. And then you're gonna have like one minute. It's like Black Friday at Blaze Church, everybody. You're gonna have one minute at most to get on and sign up for the group that you want. And we've got some fun groups. We've got some more Jesus, everybody. Who wants to get at that one? Just roasting some mores and talking about Jesus. We've got prayer and feasting where there's gonna be a different type of meat smoked every single week, walking through the Our Father. Can I get an amen for smoked meat? We've got some fun stuff going on, walking through some books of the Bible. But really there's one heartbeat behind our Blaze small groups. And it's that they exist to connect, protect, and grow with one another. It's exactly what's happening for Naomi right now. She needs someone to protect her, to walk with her. We've heard so many stories from our small group members who have said they've shown up to small group with heartache emotionally, with financial distress, and their group, their bills. Like literally found out, you can't pay your electric this month? Don't worry, the group's gonna take care of it. Oh, you're going through a hard time because you lost a family member? We're gonna, we're gonna provide you some meals and some comfort. Like this is what happens at Blaze Small Groups. And it's what Naomi needs to happen right now in her life. And so we have Boaz telling Jerry, here's Naomi, here's the land. Are you going to do it or am I going to do it? And now we get his response. He says, I will redeem it. That's not how the story's supposed to go. I want my money back. <laughs> what do you mean Jerry's going to redeem it? <laughs> this must be Ruth and Boaz, not Ruth and Jerry. That doesn't sell. What do, he's going to... Look, he says it. He, I will redeem it. To which we should all say, oh no, that's not what we want. You're telling me they had this whole scene. They chose integrity. They didn't sleep together. They're waiting to be together. And now Boaz with integrity offers first rights to Jerry and he does it? What's up with that? Well, we're going to keep reading. So Boaz said this. I love this. On the day you buy the land from Naomi, 
you also acquire Ruth the Moabite. Notice how he refers to her. That matters. The dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. Okay, so some of this is lost on us because this is not how we negotiate property sales and marriages. So let me explain what he's saying here. Along with the law of love that God provides for property redemption, he also provides the law of love to the Jewish people. That when they redeem property, if it is attached to a widow, the redeemer marries the widow and their firstborn child carries on the name of the deceased. In this case, Mehlan. So Ruth was married to Mehlan. Mehlan has died. So his name ceases. Elimelech's clan stops. There's no more tribe or clan of Elimelech. But because of the law of love, if a kinsman redeemer will purchase the land connected to the widow, he will also marry Ruth and their firstborn will inherit the rights of that land. So what Boaz is saying is, Jerry, you're so quick to say yes to redeem this because it's going to benefit you. But let me explain what this actually means as a redeemer. See, who wouldn't redeem a piece of property at this time? It's only going to benefit him. One, his reputation is going to look great. He helped out an older widow named Naomi. You know, he got her out of being purchased as a slave. He acquires land. Suddenly, he has more land to his name, so his net worth goes up a little bit. He looks like the hero. And so Boaz says, along with being the hero, just remember, you now are going to be connected to Ruth the Moabite. She's not Jewish. And the firstborn that you have is going to actually inherit the land, not your firstborn. What he's introducing is the word that is so closely associated to redemption. It's this word, sacrifice. If you are to be a redeemer, if you are going to purchase something, it's going to involve sacrifice. And I think the only way we can fully understand this is we have to travel back in time and remember something called layaway. Anyone remember layaway? <laughs> Come on, I remember layaway as a kid. Our parents, when we wanted something, they would tell us, I said, where is it? They say it's on layaway. I don't understand. It's not in the house. What does that mean? And then they would take trips to Walmart every so often and put a little bit of money on the counter. And I would watch and say, do we get it today? No, no. We have to sacrifice a little bit more so that we can redeem that item. Okay. They didn't say it that way, but that's what was happening. Right? It's layaway. It's just, there it is. I've got to sacrifice so that I might purchase it and acquire it and have it for myself. And if Jerry is to redeem Ruth and the land, he needs to be willing to sacrifice two big things. One, his reputation. Because suddenly this good Israelite man is going to be married to a Moabite woman. That impacts his reputation. It's not so great anymore for him. And second, he's going to sacrifice his legacy. His firstborn son is not going to carry on his name. It's going to carry on the name of Mehlan. So there's a lot at stake here for him to say yes at this point. The whole this benefits me thing just kind of went out the window now. Now he's got to be a true redeemer that will say by doing this, it will not benefit me, but rather it will benefit someone else. And so Boaz says, are you willing to do that? Now remember, this entire story points us to Jesus Christ, who is the true and better Boaz. And I am so thankful that we have a redeemer who said, I will sacrifice myself, who came and sacrificed his reputation who said, I will be mocked, I will be beaten, I will be cursed on a tree. The King of Kings and Lord of Lords cursed that and spit on by the people he created. He sacrificed his reputation and he sacrificed his legacy. What is rightfully his becomes ours. Those who know him, scripture says we become co-heirs with Jesus, meaning the inheritance that belongs to him alone, suddenly it becomes ours because of the perfect work of Jesus Christ. I think we should give him some praise for being our guardian redeemer who has sacrificed for us. The guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. To which... We really should understand that he says, not I cannot do it, but rather I will not do it. Because he could do it. He's next in line to do it. A good kinsman redeemer would do it, but it's going to cost him too much. We don't have a good kinsman redeemer in this man. We have someone who is focused on, what did the verse say? My own estate, my reputation, my legacy, my 
interests. Let me ask you, whose interests are you most interested in today? Who do you live for? Who do you base your finances on? Who do you base your time on? Who do you base your, your thoughts on and your goals on and your dreams on? Would you say that you are a good redeemer or one that is interested in your own estate? The words of Paul to those who are believers, Philippians 2, 4, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. This verse needs no explanation. It's very straightforward. As a follower of Christ, if that's who you are today, you have the tremendous privilege, not the burden, but the privilege to live differently by being interested in the interests of others. That is not a narrative that you will hear told in culture. That is not society's motto. Oh, step out the door and see who you can help today. Find somewhere to give your to. Serve someone, even if it impacts your time and your schedule. That's why when we live this way, church, it is so countercultural and so attractive by those who don't know Jesus. That's a promise of Matthew chapter 5. Jesus said, shine before all men. They will see your good works, and then they will give glory to the Lord. The way that you choose to serve on the dream team is not just filling a spot to volunteer on a Sunday. You are giving glory to the Lord and causing others to give him glory. The way that you make that decision to tie, to say the first 10% of my finances goes back to the Lord who's giving me everything is a way for you to give glory to God and cause others to give him glory as well. Because what you're saying to your lifestyle is don't be interested in yourself. Be interested in others too. See, these blessings that we have are not burdens. To give is not a burden. It is the greatest tool that God has given us to fight against greed. To serve is not a burden. It's a great action that fights against pride. It gives us humility. And so here we have one who says, I won't do it. It would endanger my own estate. And then we have Boaz who ends up doing it. He becomes the redeemer that Naomi and Ruth both need. Now, the scene continues, and it gets kind of weird, so we're not going to read it. It involves the man taking off his sandal, giving it to him. Just, just weird. So we're going we're to skip those verses. You can read on your own time. Let's go to the romantic part. Verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And when he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Now, I want to show you at the end of this story how God was always working, and the first way that we see God working is that God is the one that causes this couple to conceive and give birth to a son. Like, Scripture is letting us know that the children that we have come from him. He, he's, he's given us our children, parents. They come from him. And God worked out through Boaz and Ruth for their firstborn to be a son. You say, what are the chances of that? 50-50, guys. Come on. <laughs> That's a good probability. <laughs> How did that happen? And yet, Scripture wants us to know, though, so we don't just think, oh, yeah, it was just 50-50 chance. It was coincidence they had a son first. No, Scripture is clear to reaffirm what we're going to believe today. God is always working. And to us, it may not seem like a big deal. Okay, they had a son, so what? You got to understand, by them having a son, now the pieces are coming together for redemption. Now, Mehlan's name and his family tribe continues on through this son. God caused these two individuals who chose integrity before they chose feel good to now conceive and now have a son. And so the first way we see God working is that he provides a son for Ruth. Then we go on. It says, the woman said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord, who this day, he say these words with me, has not left you. The women recognize that God was always working in Naomi's life, that God had not left her. Even when she was in Moab, when she left God, the house of bread in Bethlehem, they recognized, hold on, God has not left you. God continued to provide. God was always working. How? Well, he hasn't left you without a guardian redeemer. Wait, are you talking about Boaz? We just read about Boaz. Boaz married Ruth. Notice they're talking about the son. We're going to discover his name in a minute. Praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer, the son of Ruth and Boaz. May he become famous throughout Israel. 
So they're giving praise to God. They're recognizing that he is going to be a great man. He's going to be famous. It says in verse 15, he will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. And the reason why the women use that phrase better than seven sons is seven was the number of completion and perfection in this Hebrew culture and sons were very prized because they would carry on the family name. So notice they attribute perfection and prize to a Moabite woman. How crazy is that? They say Ruth is better than perfect sons because God has not left you. Now I sat and I thought this week as I prepared and said, could Naomi had imagined that this is how her story would have turned out when in Moab she lost her husband, her two boys, and returned with one Moabite daughter-in-law, when she has lived in poverty for who knows how long in Bethlehem with her daughter-in-law going out and gleaning a practice reserved for impoverished widows, could she have ever thought that at the end of her story, women would be giving God praise because he was always working? The answer is she couldn't have thought that because none of us could think that in the seasons that we're in today because today it may feel like God is not working and it may feel like there is no hope for you, for your marriage, for your children, for your health, for your finances, for your spiritual walk. It may feel so dry and you're wondering where God is and I want you to know today, God is always working. God has not left you. God has a plan for you. If you had a plan for Naomi, I know he has a plan for you. And what we see is that Naomi continued to honor God follow him. She was real before God. Remember when she returned to Bethlehem and she said, my name is bitter. The Lord's hand's been against me, and yet God never left her. Man, there's just so much truth here for us to understand today. But like Naomi, we can often focus on our circumstances and become bitter and not see God at work. And I'm hoping today that you will see God is still working in your life. And so what does Naomi do? She took the child in her arm and she cared for him. Such a beautiful scene. A grandmother grabbing her grandson. And the women living there said, notice what they say, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. To which I want to just say, surprise. Because <laughs> this is the surprise ending to the story of Ruth the Moabite that Ruth's son Obed becomes the father of Jesse, the father of the great King David. See, Ruth is not a story of two desperate widows. Ruth is the story of a desperate people group who are in need of a saving king. It is not just about Naomi and Ruth who need a guardian redeemer. It's about the Jewish people who need a king to come to their aid to start pointing them back to Jesus. Do you remember the time period that we are reading this story in? It's the time of the judges. It says this in Judges chapter 21, verse 25. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. In the days of Ruth, in the days of Naomi, there is no king. And yet the first person that we read about, Naomi's husband's name was Elimelech. And his name meant God is my king. And yet he didn't live that way, right? He abandoned Bethlehem. He left God's people and he went to Moab, the enemy land. So he didn't live as if God was his king. None of the people of Israel did. Names matter in Jewish history. And so now they get Obed. Obed is short for Obadiah, whose name means servant of Yahweh or servant of God. And so while we start off with a man who says God is my king and yet he doesn't act that way because no Jewish person was, at the end of the story we get Obed or Obadiah who will be a servant of God whose grandson will be King David, a man after God's own heart. Isn't this cool? I mean, this is a great movie. We got we to make this a movie. It's got that surprise ending. Now, the way the story ends in its last verses seem to be lost on us. And we're not going to read them today because I didn't want to put you to sleep. Because what we get at the end of the story is simply a genealogy. And if you've ever read through scripture and you've come across a genealogy before, you've probably done what I do. Skip it. <laughs> it's like this, what is this? Son of him, son of the, I don't know. What does this mean? Okay, it means so much. And I want to encourage you to not skip the genealogies anymore. Because while they seem to be lost on us in the 21st century in the Western hemisphere where we are, 
to the centuries that it was written in, in an Eastern culture that traced their family line with pristine and precision to know who they were, it mattered. And what we get at the end of Ruth is the author starts with a man named Perez and traces from Perez 10 names down to finally David. In fact, the last name mentioned in Ruth is David. So what starts with Ruth, or with rather Naomi and Elimelech, ends with David's name. And the same genealogy that's used at the end of Ruth is the same genealogy that's used in the first book of the New Testament, Matthew. And when Matthew writes about Jesus, he names all 10 people that the author of Ruth names in his writing hundreds of years prior and shows how Jesus came from the line of David, who came from the line of Perez. See, what we're getting is this. God was not just working in the life of Naomi. He was not just working in the life of the Jewish people. He was working in all humanity to bring about the true Redeemer, who is Jesus Christ, the son of David. I mean, how cool is that? That God grafts in an enemy of Israel, a Moabite woman, and says, through you, I'm actually going to bring into the world the Messiah, the son of God. Man, that, what that should communicate to you today is that if you feel disqualified from knowing God, if you feel like you're on the outs because of how you're living or because of how you live, that God can't use you and God doesn't love you, you are completely wrong. Because in Jesus' genealogy, we see there are non-Jewish women, there are prostitutes, there are liars, there are murderers, there are thieves, there are all these people who have no right to be a part of his genealogy and they're named Because God says, I sent my son to die for everyone. I sent Jesus to redeem not just a group of people, but the entire world, that all who would believe in him and accept him will be given the right to be called the sons and daughters of God. And the story of Ruth shows us that. So what's the big point of Ruth? Well, it begins with a woman who changes her name to bitter, abandoned God's people, chooses compromise, And it ends with one who will be called King David, a man after God's own heart. And so here's what it means for us today, if you're a Christian. It means for Christians, there is no need for bitterness over our circumstances and no reason to compromise in our obedience. We live in the light of the glorious birth, not of Obed, but of Jesus. What this story should communicate to you and I is that in hard moments where we want to embrace bitterness, where we want our heart to be hardened, where we don't want to forgive that person for what they did, where we think there's no hope of restoration for our relationships, when we feel like God has abandoned us and left us, we do not need to compromise in obedience, not because we are good, but because he is good. Because we live in light of the birth of Jesus Christ. That's what this story communicates. And today, I want you to be encouraged because I do believe that in this space and online, there are so many who are asking the question we started off with, where is God? Is he working? Why has he left me? What's his plan in this season? I don't see it. Maybe like Naomi, it's been more than a decade since you've experienced the presence of God and the, the love of God where you've been actually able to see, oh, I see the plan you had for my life. And maybe... In the waiting and in the heartache, you're compromising. You're embracing bitterness. You've taken things into your own hands. You've believed the lie that God is not at work, and so as it relates to your time, you say it's going to be all about me now. I don't have time to serve others. I barely have time to make it on my own. Even though God's word says, honor one another, serve one another. Maybe it has to do with your finances. You feel so strapped and so pinned against the wall that you say, I can't give. I can't trust God with my money. I I need it all for me. And God's saying, trust me, I'm still working. Maybe it has to do with that person in your life that you've blocked, unfriended, and cut out. And you said, there's no hope of ever talking to that person again. You just hope you never see him. And God's saying, but I'm able to restore that relationship. But would you trust me? Would you, would you start to pray about forgiveness? And so I want us to be encouraged today. And the way that we're going to be encouraged is we're actually going to encourage one another. We're, we're going we're to declare three verses 
with so much confidence in our voice that this room is going to be filled with the presence of God and you're not going to understand why you came in a certain way with a burden, but you're leaving light because you're giving it to Jesus this morning because God's word is about to encourage your heart. Our worship team is going to join me and we're going to sing a song that's going to declare the promise that we've been talking about this morning that even when we don't see it, our God continues to work, that our God has a plan for our lives. And I'm going to ask everyone in this space to stand up with me as we get ready to speak out God's word. You know, scripture tells us that as we declare the word of God, as we speak life and not death, things start to happen. Things start to change. And so what I'm going to ask you to do, Blaze Church and all those who are here this morning, is on the screen, we're going to have read these so loud and with so much confidence that whatever is in your heart today, that is causing you to despair, that is causing you to embrace bitterness, that is causing you to compromise, the word of God is going to combat it in Jesus' name. Do you believe that? As I do. There was a moment where Jesus was tempted by the enemy and the weapon that he chose was the very word of God. When the enemy came, he started speaking out God's word. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna read these verses. Romans chapter eight, verse 28. We're gonna throw that on the screen. Let's say this together. And we know that those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Let's read Philippians chapter one, verse six with confidence. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. In our last verse together, I want you to say this with so much joy, with so much confidence. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. If you believe that's true, let's give God a shout of praise this morning. That is God's word for our life. That is God's word declaring that he continues to work all things out for our good, that he continues to work even when we don't see it, even when we don't feel it, our God is still working, that his mercies never come to an end. Maybe today you feel like you've used up all of the mercies of God, that there's no forgiveness left for you, that there's nothing more that he would extend to you. Why would he do that after what you've done? That is a lie from the enemy. And in Jesus' name, the enemy's lies will not last any longer in your life. Today is a freedom day. Today is a day for you to know God, for you to understand he is always working. Don't give up. Don't stop running. Don't stop chasing after the God who sent his son Jesus to this world to die for you. And so just like we declared, He works all things out for our good, having confidence that he will complete what he started and that his mercies never end. These cannot just be verses on a screen. These have to be the truth of our hearts. And so I wanna pray over you right now. And I want you to extend your hands to heaven to just say, I want God's word to change my life this morning. I don't wanna live the way I've lived. I wanna live new. I wanna live for Jesus. I want his word to change and shape me. God, right now with our hands up, we are declaring, you are always working. You never stop. You are the God who continues. Every single day, you have new mercies for us. And Lord, we trust you. We thank you for your good plans. I thank you for every person in this space that as we look to the story of Boaz and Ruth and Naomi, we find ourselves in that story. We see that you worked out your plan to bring your son Jesus to this world. And you used misfits and outsiders and liars and prostitutes and those who were the worst of the worst to show your grace is greater. And I pray a blessing on every person today. I pray God that as we begin to sing this song out, that our spirits fill up with faith, that we rejoice in who you are, recognizing you are the way maker who continues to work in every season for our good. Jesus, we worship you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, give them a good shout of praise. Come on, your very best. Let's sing this song out together. He's the God who's always working. Praise Jesus.